The information presented in this program is for educational purposes only. It is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any condition, illness, or disease. The depiction of successful results from the treatments discussed in this presentation are examples of the possible benefits and do not guarantee results. The decision to start any medical treatment should be made only after discussing all benefits and risks with a health care provider. Welcome to Healthy Dose with Dr. Joe. Are you ready to repair damage to your body? Replace what is depleting to regain your youthful vitality? Regenerate what is now degenerating? Dr. Joseph Gambardella is a doctor of chiropractic medicine and an anti-aging health practitioner diplomat. He was the first doctor in Miami to complete his fellowship training in stem cell therapies. As the owner of Advanced Physical Medicine and Rehab of Miami, he provides patients with the most sophisticated and safest treatments in the market today. Join Dr. Joe for the next half hour and learn about the medical advancements that have helped thousands avoid surgery and pain meds. From stem cells to hormones and everything in between. Get ready to feel empowered. Get ready to regain control and reclaim your life. Now, here's your healthy dose with Dr. Joe. And we're back for another podcast of Healthy Dose. I'm Dr. Joe Gambardella of Advanced Physical Medicine and Rehab of Miami. You can find us at 305-598-8788. We're here to answer all your questions. Today we have with us Dr. Efrain Gonzalez. He is board certified in cardiology and cardiac electrophysiology. He's been in practice in the Miami area since 1995. He's the former medical director of cardiac electrophysiology at Baptist Hospital. He's the former chief of cardiology Cardiology at Baptist Hospital and the former chief of medicine at Baptist Hospital. Absolutely incredible. To top that, he's the former chief of electrophysiology at Mercy Hospital and is presently in private practice. Doctor, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Let's uh, get our night going and uh, keep our patients and uh, viewers informed and hopefully clear up the air, clarify some questions and concerns and misinformations they might have. You know, I think one of the great places for us to start is why a cardiologist? Why is a cardiologist so important in today's medicine? From from my perspective as a primary care physician, I could tell you that it is a minority of patients that have a primary care physician nowadays. They're self-managing. The latest diet guru book that comes across the air, that comes across YouTube, they're following it. They're going high fat. They're going high carb. They're going high protein. But they never do blood work. They never check their blood pressure, and people are getting into trouble, and, y- and you're seeing all of it. Correct. So, you know, cardiology right now, and being a cardiologist, you're almost being looked at as a primary care physician, a portal of entry for a lot of people. It's very important to have a cardiologist on the, on the healthcare team. Correct, and, and you can look at it as a uh, last man standing, if you will. Uh, you're correct, we're actually seeing people with more complicated conditions, younger individuals, for all the reasons you decided and God knows what else is out there. Uh, misinformation is key here and it's our biggest enemy. Uh, in the, on, on the individual level, you see people who have conditions already diagnosed or they know they have it or somebody mentioned it or has been suggested, first thing is denial. It's gonna go away. Uh, same as you see, uh, joint pains, uh, neck pains, back pains, it's going to go away. Eggs and pains, um, p- uh, people tend to ignore. Uh, they take the latest fad uh, pill, massage, or whatever other uh, concoction they may uh, be given that nobody would otherwise drink or take, and they take it like it's the latest and greatest yeah. uh, in medicine. Yes. You know, there's a couple of key points that you made. I, I know being someone who enjoys working out, I see people in the gym all the time. Um, they're taking pre-workouts, monster energy drinks, all these, not even to, to, to name names, there's, there's, there's caffeinated drinks out there that people are getting 10 times the amount of caffeine into their diet on a daily basis over a prolonged period of time. So, so the age of mortality, the age of portal of entry into the cardiac office is, is like you said, getting lower and lower and lower. So we're seeing younger people with problems managing their blood pressure. We're seeing younger and younger people with cholesterol problems. Correct. And you're having more and more people on blood pressure medication. So you mentioned yeah. that's that's a big one that we have here. We'll we'll have patients that come in and they're they're self prescribing pain management medication. They're self prescribing because they injured themselves. They don't know what it's doing to their body, what it's how it's taxing their kidneys. Um, for you, when someone comes in, they're 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 
aware that they may have a problem, they are referred by their primary if they have one, that they have elevated blood pressure. You mentioned denial. Nobody wants to admit that they have to take a medication. How do you convey to your patients the importance of dealing with, quote unquote, a silent killer? Well, it's, it's, again, an example will be easy. The other day I had this one patient who came in, a lady who was in her early 50s, looked like she was 35, came in because of a cardiovascular complaint. And at the beginning of the conversation, the first thing she raises is, I don't want any medicines. So as an example, I just ask her a question as to why do we think the age of 65 was chosen in 1963 as a retirement age and Medicare benefits kicking in. And she didn't know the answer to that. Well, uh, in those days, not many people lived that long. And we didn't have that many medicines. Uh, penicillin was just released into the market in the, in the end of World War II. Morphine was just around, and maybe there was one blood pressure medication or so running around the market in those days. Uh, so health was uh, n- not around for long. Yeah. And uh, that was an eye opener. Mm-hmm. So uh, the anti medication, anti healthcare, um, trend that we have nowadays is going to bring a lot more complications in younger people yeah. faster, and uh, the healthcare force will be overwhelmed. You know, you bring up an excellent point because at some point there's only so much you can do. So, you know, genetics, hereditary factors play a part. You can have the best diet, you could be following a plant based diet, but you could still have severe risk factors that, appear, that appear on blood work. And it's it's a prideful thing for for people that they it's out of their control but it is important to manage it you know one of the biggest things that we have is people pulling themselves off of these medications and then not following up so if we ever get and i can't tell you how many times i hear it my doctor doesn't follow up with me we take blood pressure here it's elevated but i'm taking medication are you taking it regularly i didn't take it today right when was the last time you had the prescription filled months ago you know, sometimes they fill prescriptions for three months at a time, but but usually it's month to month where insurance companies go. So the non-compliance, just to, to touch on that again, is such an important factor to mention that people who <clears throat> cannot control these problems have to be responsible for what they're doing. Yes. What we do is pretty much 5% of their care. We see them, we evaluate them, we test them, we advise, we prescribe. But the minute they walk out of our doors, they're on their own. Yep. They gotta assume uh, responsibility for their own health care. Um, babysitting is not what we do. It's yeah. just they people got to mature. So if you if you're prescribed medication and you're working on your diet, you have to have your cardiologist as part of the healthcare team tracking you like a trainer along the way. If we cycle back or circle back, the majority of people don't have high blood pressure. So, so it's something that is affected by lifestyle. It's affected by diet. Let's touch a little bit about diet. Diet is something very important. We are in the obesity epidemic. Um, we have diabetes, which is out of control. All you have to do is turn the TV on at night and you see more than five um, medications that are being suggested you take for diabetes. He'll diminish this uh, event, this diminish this event, cardiovascular this, and so forth. It's a uh, big business nowadays, and it's all because we don't eat right. Yeah, and you know, it's the supermarket mentality that it's the keto diet, it's the paleo diet. Plant-based is coming into popular. Like you mentioned mm-hmm. before, everything is cyclical. So these yes. are not necessarily new trends, but things that come around over and over and over mm-hmm. again. But dietary management is important. Exercise is very important. I read a study that they said that 10 10-minute walks a day were more effective at managing insulin resistance than taking metformin. Correct. It's, it's absolutely incredible. Yeah. One of the things that we need to uh, not forget is that we monitor blood sugars with all the medications we're prescribing, but there's other deranged diabetes brings, and met- lipid metabolism is totally deranged. Uh, you see these people with uh, neuropathies, uh, mm-hmm. increased risk of infections, and, and all we do is check the blood sugar. And all that pill brings down is uh, the blood sugar. So one of the bigger steps for adult onset diabetes is eat right, don't become a diabetic, yeah. continue to move, don't stay still, Drop the cell phone, drop the remote control, get out. Yeah. And walk the dog. And and, just... and everyone that's listening to the podcast can't see Dr. Gonzalez right now, but he's he, you want him to be your cardiologist. He looks like a TV model. <laughs> right? He, he's, he's in shape. 
He looks fantastic. He works out. He practices what he preaches. So what he says, is, what he says is true. And, you know, we're talking about a minority of cases, so to speak, that may have high blood pressure. The majority don't. But there is an epidemic of obesity. I think you touched on this. In, in physical medicine, we talk about a terrible triad that affects knees. Mm -hmm. So someone will damage their medial meniscus, they'll damage their ACL, and they'll damage their medial collateral ligament. You're seeing more and more of a triad now in cardiology that you touched a little bit upon high lipids, yes, elevated blood pressure, mm -hmm. and elevated blood sugar. Correct. And, and the management of these is, is marginal at best because of noncompliance and because of, not, of people not addressing their right. diet. One of the biggest issues is uh, high blood pressure. Just uh, We were just talking a little while ago. Uh, the uh, magic number for high blood pressure uh, historically has been 140 or 90, and that was not by medical design. It was a health care, uh, uh, life health insurance uh, people that actually came up with it. Uh, the uh, individual who was selling the life insurances realized that if your blood pressure was higher than 140 or 90, they was more likely to be able need to pay for your mm -hmm policy rather than not. So we doctors didn't do that. As we learned from this individual back in 1957. And the number has gone up and down over the years and uh, all we try to do is try to diminish or stop the progression to end stage renal disease and hemodialysis and so far we've been unsuccessful. For all the factors we just cited and others we probably still don't understand completely. Yeah, there's, there's something that we share in common with our patients is that when people are over medicating because they're not addressing the cause of their pain, 99% of the patients that come to see us are, are interested in managing a symptom. They don't even understand that there's a reason their body's breaking down, why they're, they're, they're expressing these inflammatory markers. Um, so they start taking medications, anti-inflammatories, but they don't realize the damage that they're doing to, to, the, to the nephrology, to their kidneys. Mm -hmm. Now you have patients that have uncontrolled hypertension, and, and the biggest risk factor that you're gonna see is of course damage to the heart, to the vessels right. of the heart, but, but talk about damage to the kidneys. Yes, we have known that since the age of aspirin, and by the way, aspirin has been taken out of cardiovascular care as a prophylactic anti-inflammatory drug. There was the announcement by the FDA, CMS, and NIH and so forth last November, whereby apparently all the data that we had uh, that led to the aspirin is good for you was wrongly estimated, miscalculated, misrepresented, and so forth, that the whole anti-inflammatory process is guided and treated and managed by statin or cholesterol-lowering agents that works. Now we have the uh, PKS29 inhibitors and so forth, and so aspirin is out. All aspirin did was increase the number of brain bleeds and GI bleeds rather than prevent cardiovascular issues. Now one has just had a stent put in, and then you need underplated agents, of course, for the time that's necessary for the stent to heal and, and be uh, recovered by your own tissues. But uh, other than that, aspirin should not be part of our armamentarium. And yes, they do damage the kidneys. That's, that's a huge takeaway for everyone listening to the show. You need to speak to your, cardio, your cardiologist if that's something that you're using prophylactically. One of the interesting things that we let our patients know is, as it relates to pain, is they're taking Advil, Aleve, Motrin, Naproxen, all of these medications that are available that a child could buy over the counter. Um, no one ever reads the back of the bottle. You know, w w the people are always floored when it says, do not use longer than prescribed. And on every single bottle of anti-inflammatories, it says, do not use longer than 10 days unless prescribed by your physician. Right. But you see the commercials that they prescribe them for allergies, they prescribe them for uh, PMS, they prescribe it for back pain. Sleep and they sell And they sell them in bottles of a thousand. Yes. A thousand. A thousand pills. So, yeah. um, you know, taking excess medications, like you mentioned, whether it be uh, an aspirin, whether it be abuse of these anti-inflammatory medications, for longer than designed is always going to damage the body. What you <clears throat> mentioned is very important. If you've had a stent placed, you, you, you may have to take an aspirin for a period of time. If you've had a corrective surgery, if you've had an arthroscopic procedure, that's what these medications are designed for. Correct. Not to be taken long term. Correct. Second, second major takeaway from, from today's show. Um, one of the things that we should ta touch on as well is prevention. 
So we touched on diet. You have to find a diet that works for you. I think we're both in agreement that the first step to finding out what diet works for you is getting blood work done. Correct. You have to look at blood work. And one of my pet peeves over the years is the interpretation of blood work used by physicians. In other words, a standard panel is ordered. In a standard panel, the the markers that we find most important in controlling inflammation of the heart, inflammation of the body, are not part of a standard panel. Testosterone, free testosterone, growth hormone, prolactin, vitamin D is now becoming more accepted. But you can get a blood panel done that has a complete blood count, a metabolic panel, a lipid panel, and that's it for most doctors. That's what they test for. Correct. Yeah. Yes. The I think the trend is going to change at some point. People will have to personalize care. Um, patients have to demand better from their doctors. Doctors have to step up to the plate. Uh, we all have to, and actually uh, coordinate patients' care. Uh, just uh, make sure that we're driving preventive care rather than patch the hole that was yeah. made over the and, years. And this is not something that's unattainable, even for people that don't have insurance. For for $200, you can get full full blood work done at, at our office that tests for testosterone, PSA, free testosterone, growth hormone, all of the markers that control inflammation. And once you know what your, your panel markers are, you're going to find a diet that works specifically for you. If you want to lose 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 pounds safely and effectively, you could do it if you know which diet to follow. Correct. If we know what your inflammatory markers are, so this is a, this is a segue into a topic that you and I have a lot of passion for. Um, there is a term out there called hormonophobia. We, Correct. We deal with this in the field of regenerative medicine and stem cells where there's no, it's, it's like talking about race, religion, and politics. Mm-hmm. There's no gray area. You have very, very strong views on, on either side of the aisle. In my opinion, in the clinical research with stem cells, it's not that we think they work. We know they work. So people that say they don't work, they don't have enough information to say that because we know that we'd only live a day or two without them. They're involved in every healing process in our body. It's the same thing with hormones. This hormonophobia. Um, we'll touch a little bit of, uh, on this right after the break. We're going to talk about how hormones got a bad name, why years ago they were, pre- they were prescribed safely and effectively and controlled the incidence and adverse risk of heart disease, but we'll find out how they got a bad name and what we're doing about it today right after this. Prepare your body. Replace your key hormone levels. Allow your body to regenerate itself without surgery or meds. When it comes to your health, the best plan is preventative. If you wait for symptoms to show, you could be too late. With over 40 years of combined clinical experience, all under one conveniently located state-of-the-art facility, Dr. Joe is on the leading edge of regenerative and physical medicine. Take control of your health and get a free consultation and evaluation. Visit us at apmrmiami.com or call 305 598 87 305-598-8788. And we're back with Dr. Efrain Gonzalez, and we're speaking about the role of hormones and cardiovascular health. Doc, right before the break, we spoke about the term hormonophobia. And this is a media-driven term. Um, there's the mob mentality that exists today. It existed yesterday. But one of the things that we need to let the audience know is that there is a lot of information supporting the use of balancing and elevating testosterone levels and improving cardiac health. Dr. Abraham Morgenthaler, who's the associate clinical professor of urology at Harvard Medical School, is one of the preeminent researchers in the country that talks about this data. And the bad name for hormones came about in about 2013. Correct. Out of all of the published research articles that talk about testosterone and cardiovascular health or cardiovascular risks, out of the dozens and dozens that are published in peer review, really four brought into question that there may be an adverse risk associated with someone supplementing or elevating testosterone. And it started with a November 2013 article published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Um, And it was by Dr. Vegan. And what that study showed or supportedly showed was that the incidence of cardiovascular risk factors, namely 
heart disease or myocardial infarction, stroke and even death increased within a population of patients that elevated or took testosterone who already had cardiovascular risk factors. They also said that men who had low testosterone in this group that did not take testosterone suffered far less adverse effects. Correct. That's exactly what they cited. However, as you're going to mention in a few minutes, uh, data were not correctly represented. In, in fact, what they initially published that was that the risk of heart attack, stroke, and even death of those who took testosterone was 25% in the group as far as three years out. The, the group that did not take it, as initially reported, was 19.9%. So lower is always better when you're talking about statistics. What they, what they further studied or, or analyzed, specifically Dr. Morgan Tyler and his group, was that the authors that published this study used statistical methodology that was not widely known at the time, not extensively studied or validated. And, and, and what they found out was that in actuality, the men in the group who had an adverse event counted as more than one in the study. And men who did not have an adverse effect when they took testosterone counted as less than one. They further turned out that in actuality, the percentage of individuals who had an adverse reaction when taking testosterone was lower than the group that did not take testosterone. Correct. Also interesting is the distribution of patients. So to sum it up, the group of patients that took testosterone that had cardiovascular weakness was 10%. The group who had cardiovascular episodes that did not take testosterone had adverse risks of heart disease, of, of stroke, death and stroke of 21.2%. So it actually doubled. Double. All of that Correct. statistical analysis yeah. says that those who did not take testosterone had poorer outcomes than those who did. And that's represented in the heart failure population as well. So it's something, in fact, well known. It's um, sad that these people misrepresented data that could have been useful. And of course, you know, there's been numerous medical organizations that have petitioned JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, to retract or at least publish the correct data. To my knowledge, it still hasn't been... Hasn't been published yet. Hasn't published, but it doesn't dissuade us or it doesn't dissuade you from utilizing this to help your patients. No, because evidence is out there to suggest that it's actually beneficial. The first step that everybody should look at before you jump into... Um, replacement, uh, hormonal replacement at any sex or age or whatever, is what happens during childhood. Kids, boys will have a higher risk of mortality, sudden cardiac death, and arrhythmias before teenage. Once the hormones kick in, uh, the uh, risk reverses. Girls, unfortunately, take the higher uh, risk, and boys, because of the testosterone load, which manipulates and manages potassium channels in the heart, lowers the yeah. risk. And, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I like to do with our patients, too, is just keep things as simple as possible. And I, I always present it to patients. How many 18 to 25-year-olds do you know that are running around with high blood pressure, hyperlipidemia, and... Um, you know, and, and high blood pressure. Or morbid obesity. Or more, it's, it's very, very low. Very low. So what's, what's, what happens at 18 to 25? Hormone levels are the highest. Testosterone is surging. People want to run through walls. They mm -hmm. feel great. But, but what happens to the average 40, 50, 60-year-old? Everything know, is reversed. What's the, what's the median age of your, of your practice right now, would you say? Uh, right now, I think it's trending to a lower uh, age group. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's unfortunate because we used to have our patient population in the cardiology offices were over 65 and mm -hmm. much older. And all of a sudden, we're seeing a surge of mid-30s to low-40s, which are within that uh, group yeah. that you just described. Uh, you know, it, it's funny that you said that too, because what's the age that the average athlete retires? In the 30s, right? In their 30s, so yes. So it, it correlates with the drop in testosterone. So here, here's the thing. People don't know that testosterone is probably the strongest anti-inflammatory hormone that's found in the body. It, by controlling inflammation, you reduce pain, you enhance healing, you have deeper sleep and recovery, your sex drive is great, you have better interactions with your peers, but when testosterone is low, 
right? The increase of heart disease that we mentioned, the increase in stroke. In fact, there was a study we, we spoke about, uh, I think it was the Kansas City VA study. Correct. Which, which is very a very large population. I think 83,000 people studied Correct. over 15 years. And what they found out was that people that supplemented testosterone were 56% less likely to die of all-cause mortality. If you could tell your patients who have cardiovascular stress that you can give them something, recommend something if they need it, yes. that's going to decrease their, their likelihood to die by 50%. Yeah, who, One, who would deny that? Yeah, nobody should deny that to the patients. Access to that, I think, information to the patient population or potential patient population is key here. Yes. The other thing that everybody has to pay attention is not many studies run for 15 years. Yes. Most, Excellent point. Yeah, most cardiovascular studies would run for two to five years, sometimes shorter. I mean, the, there there are studies out there that for sudden cardiac death that were cut short at six or eight months because of the great benefit to patients, and this is a 15 year uh, old. I mean, a 15 year duration study, and that's I think it's very important. It's not, it was not done lightly, not superficially, and it was done long term. Yeah. So let's talk about a couple of key points. This is not an age-specific problem. As you said, your, your patient base is trending on the lower end. We see in, in schools now, physical education is almost non-existent. So the ways that men traditionally and women increase their natural hormone production is by exercising. Correct. So less exercise, we see increases in fat, right? So fat stores estrogen. If there is a hormone that's linked in excess amounts to cardiovascular disease, it's, it's estrogen in men and women. Correct. And so that's another big misconception. But let's talk about what people need to know. You got to get your blood work tested. You got to check, check for testosterone. There is a huge difference in looking at these panel markers between optimal and normal. And so the normal range, I got one for you, as you mentioned, you know, how did people find out about 65 being the, uh, the cutoff point you said, you know, for, for Medicare. And exactly. Why did people, or how did they come up with this range of 258 to 1197 for the range of testosterone? Probably random checks rather than actual uh, statistical analysis of what's normal, what's optimum, and yeah, so what's so par. Th they, yeah. actually, they actually surveyed people over time, and they found out that the average 18 to 25-year-old had a testosterone level in excess of 900. The average 70-year-old had a testosterone level of 358 or below. Right. And the numbers may change by 50 or 100 points. It's, it's an enormous difference in the physical makeup of a 18 to 25-year-old versus a 70-year-old that's completely deconditioned, that may be overweight, definitely has less muscle mass, lower testosterone, elevated estrogen, cardiovascular markers are elevated. But, but the interesting thing is, is that's, that's hundreds of points of, of a difference. Correct. But I would ask you, what do mm. they call the average practitioner, maybe the, the non-informed practitioner? A 40-year-old comes in who's fatigued, complaining that he can't lose weight, struggling at work, struggling in his relationship, and he comes in with a testosterone level of 390. What does the average practitioner call him? It's normal. And, and that's, that, that's, that's a very, very big takeaway. Just yes. because you're in normal range does not mean Correct. you're optimal. Correct. Everything, everything as it relates to blood should be in the optimal range. Right. We're going back to personalizing care for the individual. Not the, uh, the individual sitting in front of you is not a population, is not a number. It's him or her, and we probably should do our best to optimize his um, well-being. And so, and so we treat the individual, not just the lab. Correct. And so by looking at, at, at these hormones, these are all hormones that are produced in the body. They're called bioidentical. And we spoke earlier, if someone, if you're, if you're working on somebody and they need, you know, you're doing surgery and they lose blood, it takes 180 days, right? 120 days to make new red blood cells. You can't wait three months for them to produce enough blood for them to be viable and to have a great recovery. You got to bring it in. You got to transfuse it in. Got to bring it in. If you are not making enough testosterone, you have to bring it in. You have to supplement in some way, shape, or form, period. Yeah. We have to stop demonizing hormone replacement yes. and actually see its benefits. Uh, it's If it's well managed, of course. Yes. 
it should benefit the individual. Yeah, and, and you have to go to a doctor like Dr. Gonzalez. You can visit us at APMR Miami. Someone who's trained in this. This is not something that you dabble in. You, 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 you have to have a great understanding of this. You have to quote unquote specialize in this and really have your patient's best interest in mind. You know, the flip side of this is there are many offices that are prescribing testosterone, uh, but they don't manage the patient after that. It's the same thing as anything else. If you prescribe a drug and don't follow up with the patient, Correct. what are you doing? Actually, I have an example again for you. <laughs> I have a friend of mine who actually came to the office uh, a few months ago stating that his friend, Dr. So-and-so, gave him the prescription for testosterone to self-administer with no follow-up, no nothing. And I just saw him a couple of weeks ago with uh, not the desired effect. Yeah. And he had some uh, ill effects, so to speak, uh, to mismanaging himself. And actually, he was redirected to you yeah. actually yeah you know uh, and, to, uh, to actually get corrective action because it's just uh you can't just some some of our hardest patients to manage are yes. the ones that have been prescribed before exactly too much of you, know, you everyone recognizes that kale is a superfood but too much kale is damaging to the body yeah. so eating too many good foods in excess quantities caloric intake is damaging to the body so too much of a good thing is not good either yes. it has to be managed so you get all the benefits and no side effects uh, you know we, we speak about also one of the you know hormonophobia that there's a big difference between hormones that we prescribe in our office hormones that you prescribe that are called bioidentical meaning exactly what's produced in the body versus synthetic correct so as we know why do synthetic medications exist one of the reasons is is because hormones are secretions that occur in the body. Uh, they can't be patented by a drug company. They can't be sold for profit. So compounded formulas, these bioidenticals that our body makes that, that are produced in a lab in a nearly identical fashion to what's made in the body. Um, synthetic variations are also made the exact same way with the additional esters or components added to the products. Why do they do that? Well, they do it primarily for profitable gain. Correct. So you can sell a drug for great, great, great profit, but you can't sell something that's made in the body for the same profit. So all of, further studies show that adverse effects occur with synthetic medications, whether even if you're talking about females, Premarin, Provera, tons and tons of studies show adverse effects of taking synthetic estrogen and progesterone versus taking bioidentical. I know that's a hot topic for you about yeah, it's, it's, managing females as well. Yes, uh, that's something that everybody should actually pay attention to, especially the ladies and or husbands and brothers and sisters and whatnot. It's just something that uh, I constantly strive for referring my patients back to the gynecologist to get evaluated for hormone replacement. There's a lot of resistance out there mm -hmm. uh, as well as there's a lot of good doctors that are actually will take care of this uh, ladies but it's something that we all have to pay attention to and uh, uh, up until recently perimenopausal symptoms were just ignored yes as normal you have to put up with it and and i, th I think only now people are opening their eyes and to actually helping these ladies and uh, having um, a lesser a bumpy ride. Yeah. So, you know, women, it's the same thing. They make testosterone too. They just make a, a, a fractional dose compared to men, right. but the effects are the same in the body. For women that want to have a great looking physique that are over 35 years old, they want to lose fat. They want to increase muscle mass. They want to have a great relationship at home. They want to have better recovery. They want to be able to deal with the kids. They have to find out what their testosterone level yeah. is. And then, so, so the same, the range for females, men, it's 358 to 1197 or 250 to, to, to 1200 females. It's two to 45. Correct. Guess, guess what the average number is for most women that we see doc. No idea. Be, be, be t between two and 10. There you go. So if, if you're dealing with anything in the lower 25%, you're going to get 25% of, of what you can get out of life. Right. So elevate, it's the easiest thing to manage in women. Right. A fractional, two milligrams a week could change a marriage. One, yes. Not only that, what we just spoke about uh, a few minutes ago, just before we started the podcast, is that you ought to start hormonal replacement in females at a right age. Not yes. when they're 75 or or around that age when trying to convert a 75-year-old lady onto a 40-year-old is going to have adverse effects in the cardiovascular system. In fact, I think we both read the same study that said postmenopausal women that began their replacement six years after had significantly better results than those who began 10 years. I think the Correct. results of 10 years were more adverse, adverse th th rather than, than beneficial. beneficial. Yep. So what does that mean? For women that are postmenopausal, you've gone a year without a period. 
postmenopausal, the sooner you begin that and get under care to at least know what your baseline is, the better your outcomes are going to be. Now, what about the women that are perimenopause or, or they have not yet hit menopause? You still have to have optimal levels of growth hormone. You still have to have optimal levels of testosterone. Correct. Those are all things that can be started yeah. earlier, and prevention is, is the best medicine. Again, personalizing care is the key here. Just uh, testing each patient as an individual, not as a range or a population management. It's just uh, manage the patient with potential disease processes or prevent disease processes in that particular individual. So I, I think going back to the old days where you have your personal physician, your doctor you trust, physicians assuming that role of res being responsible for patients' care and well-being will help us resolve this situation. So, Doc, let's talk about you. If someone wants to come see you, they hear you on the podcast, do they need to go to their primary to get a referral? Can they come see you directly if they don't have insurance? How do, how do people come and find you? Well, it varies. Again, uh, depending on the insurance company, some of them will require um, authorizations, referrals. Most companies are moving away from that now because it's becoming more costly for them, uh, and um, they're, they're just seeing the benefit of it. Uh, cost containment and so forth. Uh, patients can call the office at 786-703-6120, and we're located on, on Kendall Drive, 11120 Southwest 88th Street, the suite is 102. Uh, phone call will do. Uh, they can find us on the online, on the web, on Facebook. Again. How do they find you on Facebook and on the web? Um, they basically put my name up there, and it should pop up and populate our web page uh, and so forth. Fantastic. This, this, this is an absolute must. Out of all the shows that we've done, Dr. Gonzalez, his time is in demand. He's he's an amazing doctor. I mean, just, just getting out the credentials took up half the show here. <laughs> but Thank widely, you. widely versed. He's a pioneer in his field. Not all cardiologists are created the same. I think one of the biggest enemies that maybe we could end the show in talking about this, one of the biggest enemies to doctors and to their patients alike is a big ego. Yes. They're thinking that they've, they're, they've come out of school and they know everything. Everything, and dissuading yeah. patients from seeking alternatives when they, they, they themselves may not know enough about it to say yes or no. Correct. They actually just took the words out of my mouth. The first thing I teach young doctors and fellowship is just the day you think you know it all, hang up the gloves, go fishing. Yeah. I said, you, you got to think out of the box constantly. You got to keep your eyes open. Um, you got to strive for different things, new things. Um, Keep your eyes open, mind open, and you'll benefit your patients. Again, we were with Dr. Gonzalez. Doc, they find you at your phone number? 786-703-6120. As always, another great show. I'm Dr. Joe Gambardella, Advanced Physical Medicine and Rehab. You can find us at apmrmiami.com. You can follow us at Instagram, at APMR. If you need blood work, if you need a referral to Dr. Gonzalez, um, if you just want to feel better, whether it's your neck, your back, your shoulders, your knees, call the office 305-598-8788. The first step to getting healthy is taking action. Come see us and we'll set you in the right direction. We'll see you next time.